Hello everyone, welcome to Music Technology, Electronic Music and Recording Arts. If you've received a tech pack bundle with equipment to use for your courses, I'm going to go over all of the components right here, right now. So you can go ahead and get your stuff and set it up with me, okay? I've already taken out the computer and I've already taken out the USB hub so that it can be ready for us to plug in our interfaces. I'm gonna cover both the Scarlett 2i2 interface as well as the Apollo Twin. First, we're gonna set up our mic stand. We're going to loosen the fastener on the base first to get our stand upright on the ground. So I loosened the fastener, I extended it, and then tightened it at the end. And then I extend the feet here, and now we can place it on the ground. This knob right here is called the clutch, and it twists to loosen. And this is how we can adjust the height of our microphone. So we can tighten the clutch at the height that we want. This part right here is called the boom. This boom can make it so that you can stand farther away from the mic stand if you are playing an instrument and need to have the microphone out away from the stand. Typically, we would use this for instrumentalists. You might not need to use it right away. So we um, adjust the boom by twisting this dumbbell fastener or T-bar to loosen and adjust the boom part of the mic stand. We want a good height to set our shock mount here We'll screw in at the top so we can tighten our fasteners to make sure everything is tight. No pieces are loose so that we have a secure stand to put our shock mount. If you are using the AKG condenser microphone, I will be demonstrating that one first. You're gonna go ahead and gently remove the shock mount from the case, this piece here. It's called a shock mount because it prevents vibrations from the ground or the environment to from hitting the microphone. This microphone is a very sensitive condenser microphone, so our shock mount is essential. When you're not using these pieces, they like to stay in their case to preserve the quality. This is important. There's a little piece in here that will not be compatible with this screw. So you're going to need to unscrew this so I ended up using a penny and it fits right in the grooves there to loosen this adapter piece that we will just keep in the case because we don't need it right now. Here we have our screw that we're going to attach to this portion of our mic stand. I do this by loosening the fastener on this part of the stand so that I can twist it easily. You're going to hold the shock mount with your opposite hand, align the threads here very carefully, and use your right hand to twist the mic stand into the fastener on the shock mount so that it lines up evenly and attaches securely. all set here so we want to position our shock mount to where if we were to adjust the boom part of the stand then our shock mount would remain in place if we were to extend the boom stand outward like this Okay, there's other fasteners to make sure you check and make sure that they are tight, such as the one that hinges the shock mount itself, the T-bar on the boom stand of your mic stand, and all of the knobs that extend and lengthen. 
the clutch is here at the base. We have several knobs here at the top that can control the length of our boom. And we just always double check to make sure that these are secure. Okay, we're ready to attach our microphone to our shock mount. The shock mount has a screw here built in at the bottom. And this is how we secure the microphone to the shock mount. It's important that it remains secure to prevent any hazards such as the mic stand tipping over or anything dramatic as such as that. We don't want our microphone to fly out of the shock mount and get damaged or injure anybody. So we are going to carefully rest it into the shock mount and tighten the screw. When we're doing this, we need to pay attention to where the front of our microphone is. Here on the AKG, where you see the logo and where you see our polar patterns here is going to be the front or the main direction of the mic where it receives sound from. This particular microphone also is bi-directional and omnidirectional. So depending on where you have this switch assigned, you will be capturing sound from different parts of the microphone. But it is important to remember that this is the primary direction or the front of the microphone here. So we want to fasten it onto the shock mount as such so that it's facing the proper direction of our sound source. I'm going to gently rest the microphone with my opposite hand and hold it in position while I screw the fastener on the shock mount in to the microphone. As you can see here, the front of the mic is facing toward where the sound will be coming from while recording. And this is all set to be plugged in to a cable into an interface. Okay, if you have an MXL condenser mic, I'll be demonstrating how to fasten the mount for this mic onto our mic stand. So we have a stand that we've set up exactly the way we showed you. And again, I'm going to make sure that the attachment that has my screw here at the top is loosened. Our stand mount for the MXL microphone looks like this. It's a lot simpler than the shock mount and it has a screw threader in here as well that fits directly on top of our stand here. So I've got this piece loosened to where I can twist it and I'm going to align them together to thread that through very carefully and securely. Once again, when I'm finished, I'm going to tighten the piece that I loosened, making sure all of our components are tight. There's also a, on the clip here is a knob that can change the direction of the stand mount. So as you can see here, I have fits this to where if we were to need to use our boom part of the mic, we would loosen the dumbbell, the dumbbell here or the T-bar and we can extend our boom out this way, loosening whatever we need to extend to the height and position that we want. And as you can see here, my stand mount is ready for my microphone to be placed. The MXL has a piece on the bottom called a nut and it comes unscrewed and this is the piece that we use to fasten the microphone to the stand mount. Once again, I'm holding my screw piece in one hand and the mic in the opposite and I gently rest so that it fits here into the stand mount and I fasten the nut on the bottom to secure it. So as you can see, we once again have the front of the mic, which is the part that has our logo facing toward where our sound source would be coming from. In this case, 
my voice is right here. Therefore, I would face it toward this direction. Or if I was playing a guitar down here, I would also have it facing this direction. I just want to point out that is very common to have any of these knobs or pieces or components to go loose and to fall off or go missing. So that's why I'm stressing the importance of tightening your fasteners all throughout the mic stand so that all components remain intact. I will just demonstrate that just now I had a piece of my T-bar or my dumbbell come unscrewed and fall off. And these parts can easily go missing as you might imagine. So we're just constantly checking our gear to make sure that everything is fastened and secured where it belongs so that things don't go missing and things don't need to be replaced later on. So be mindful of these pieces in particular and just make sure that they're always tight whenever you're adjusting your T-bar dumbbell for the boom stand. I'm going to put it back in its spot. If you ever run into trouble with your hardware and you're not sure where things or components go once they've come undone, you can bring in your items and I can help you fix them. Or you can send me a quick email and I can try to walk you through it via the telephone or on an email. So no worries. If things go loose, that it's totally normal and it's just the another reason why we continue to check our gear for anything that might cause a hazard or anything that might fall off or go missing. Okay, up next, I'm going to demonstrate how to attach your pop filter to your mic stand. Pop filters are used to um, prevent plosives or sibilants from hitting your microphone. So harsh S's or harsh uh, P's or T sounds, those things can create puffs of air that go into the mic and don't sound pleasant. So that's what a pop filter is for, to filter the pops. So if I have my mic stand upright as this MXL is currently, then I would probably set up the pop filter to take on this type of shape here to where it's in the right position to block any of those plosive sounds that we want to prevent. We need to make sure that there is an accessible part of the mic stand to where our pop filter can be secured. So I've found this part of our stand to where I'm going to grip our pop filter around in its position. So this is all just done by a tension knob. So you're just going to loosen it to the point where your mic stand can fit inside of your compartment here before tightening and securing with tension from this knob here. So my pop filter is now fixed to the stand and can be positioned in front of my microphone if things need to be readjusted to make it more aligned then that's good so now i've got more of a direct cover or filter over my microphone like this this would be a good place to start to prevent getting those plosives on your microphone. Next, I'm going to show you how we can configure our mic stand with our shock mount to work with a pop filter. And I'm gonna show you a different type of position that you can have your microphone in. So here we have the AKG shock mount set up the way we did in our demonstration. This would be a perfectly fine way to record using the AKG. And if we chose this positioning, then we would just attach our pop filter to a sturdy part on the stand here in a way that would align our pop filter to cover the microphone from its sound receiving direction. What I'm gonna do here is show you a different way to position your mic stand if you're using a shock mount such as this. This is done in a lot of studios and it might work for you in your space, but we actually would invert the microphone using our boom fastener here. I would loosen, loosen our knob here and invert the, mic stand, the microphone piece on the boom as such. 
And now our shock mount hangs our microphone in this up in an upside down position, which can then be adjusted using the boom. So here we have a hanging from above style of position for our mic stand. And we can attach our pop filter from underneath, such as this. More commonly would probably be from above as well. So I'm just going to make sure that this will fit onto our mic stand here. Loosen the pop filter to where our tension can fit around the base of the stand. And there you have it. I attached our pop filter here to the base and pulled the filter around the front to cover the sound receiving part of our microphone. So now any sibilance or plosive sounds will be filtered through our nylon pop filter and will not affect the quality of our vocal takes. Our mics are ready, but we need something to plug them into. So we have to get our interfaces set up I'm going to start by demonstrating how to plug in all the components to your Apollo Twin. This is an amazing piece of equipment and you should treat it as such. <laughs> um, I have a power source here for it because it needs its own power because it's going to do a lot of work for you and your computer. So the power cord has like a lock on it so you'll see that the cord itself has a little arrow so that's going to be the part that inserts directly straight up and you can see by the little picture on the back here that if you stick it there and then turn it to the left that um, it locks in place so that you don't unplug in the middle of a session that would be a little bit uh, dramatic and uh, could be catastrophic for your session. <laughs> So um, this power box and really long cable would plug into the wall. It also has the uh, Thunderbolt cable, which is just a really new and powerful uh, connector. Um, so this is how we plug our Apollo Twin into our computer. We do have the USB hub set up here, but since this is a compatible connection with the port on our computer, we're gonna go directly in. And Mr. Dow says that the cable works better with the lightning bolt facing upward. And I've just gotten in the habit of doing it that way. Same thing into the port on the left side of your MacBook. So when you have your computer on, you're logged into your student account, you'll see on the bottom right hand side of your dock, on the bottom of your screen, two uh, blue triangle diamond um, icons that say UAD meter and control panel and console. You can go ahead and click those, open them up and power on your device and your device will start to work and blink and light up and connect with your computer. I'll go over how to do a uh, connection setup and uh, your signal routing in the computer in a different video right now. We're just setting up all of our hardware, okay? That's it for the Apollo Twin. And if you had an AKG microphone here, we will then go for our XLR cable. Some of you may have two of these because you have two microphones and some of you may just have one. I'll only demonstrate on, I'll use the same cable to demonstrate both on the twin and the focus right because it's the same kind of idea. So the part with the holes is what's going into the mic. And we gently plug the cable into the mic and this side comes to the back of our interface here in one of these slots, either input one or two. So we go ahead and plug that one in. 
And then your mic is set up. Okay, up next we're gonna show you how to plug in all the parts to our Focusrite Scarlett 2i2. Super popular, great for anyone to kind of get used to knowing how to use, um, especially in the home studio environment. So this has kind of a regular USB blade. It's one that you're kind of traditionally used to seeing for a USB connector. And it also has a USB-C universal connector, like the type that's compatible with your MacBook. However, this side, the USB-C universal, is the one that plugs into the Focusrite. Now the Focusrite is USB powered. So it's gonna get power from your computer. So it's really important that you have your computer connected to a charger. It may be kind of hard to make out that work with two ports on the side of your computer, but with your USB hub, you also have an additional two charging ports that you can use um, to as extra USB-Cs or, um, yeah, charging. Um, so this is the part that needs to go into our computer. It's not directly compatible with the ports on our computer, but we do have a USB hub that we can plug in our traditional USB connector into. And my USB green light turned on, that means that it's receiving power. And if you're in a DAW like Logic or Pro Tools, there will be different ways for you to get this to communicate with your computer, which I will show you in a different video. Today, we are just setting up the hardware. So now I have the MXL mic here. Once again, the connector that has the holes will be the one that attaches to the microphone. And the other side with the pins goes into either channel one or channel two into the focus right. These microphones are condensers, so both of them will require phantom power. You'll learn more about that later but you may not receive a signal until you've engaged phantom power, which is something that you do um, after everything's plugged in, when um, everything is securely um, powered and charged because it's just sending voltage to the microphones to activate them and make them work and power them on. So now we've set up everything that we need to record um, through a microphone using the Focusrite. All right, I'm going to show you how to get your Casio Tone keyboard set up with its power and its sustain pedal. So the power is in the front pocket of the case and it plugs into this center component right here, the DC. And get it plugged in, you can power it on and it is a perfectly functional keyboard. You can dial in with the circular uh, little clock thing <laughs> to uh, go to different sounds. It has this built-in sound library of its own and the speaker system is really good. Um, so this is music box number 39. I think it sounds great and I think you can um, have a metronome established. Know, gives me nightmares but okay so other things in your keyboard case are the uh, sheet music attachment that literally just drops right in there comes right off it's not secured by any means um, but you've already noticed that the whole thing is really lightweight and portable um, and our sustain pedal is included sustain is an expressive pedal when we plug in our sustain pedal to the back of the keyboard it should um, automatically start working as soon as you press the sustain 
and play your notes. You can hear that expressive pedal effect that goes away once I drop the pedal and release, sustain and release. If it doesn't automatically start working with your pedal, a lot of times you can power off and power back on your keyboard so that it recognizes this connection here. But another feature of our sustain pedals is this switch on the back. It says plus or minus. So this can also engage your sustain pedal and make it more versatile even as like a damper pedal. So sometimes if this switch is on, let's say the plus side, I'm not pressing the sustain pedal, but I'm experiencing sustain in my notes. And so now the pedal is operating as a damper, meaning that when I press the pedal, it actually dampens the sound or cuts it off. So again, with the switch over here on the minus side, I'll switch it back over. Now it's acting as a traditional sustain where when I'm pressing it, I'm experiencing the expressive sustained notes that will be released as soon as I release my foot from the pedal and release release. So the onstage pedal that you've received also serves as a damper pedal if the music that you're practicing or the selections you're practicing require the use of a damper pedal. That makes this pedal more versatile. Whereas on a traditional grand piano, um, there are two different pedals that do those two different functions. And so sometimes it is written in your music that you'll need the pedal or you'll need to dampen your notes. And so that just makes this uh, pedal just more versatile for music majors. You will probably only need to keep it on the side that makes it sustain your notes rather than dampen your notes. But it's just important to know that this pedal can do both. Your keyboard also came with a music stand, which is an attachment that just rests here on the handle of your keyboard. It's not secured anywhere. It just pops on and off. And as you can see, the whole thing is very lightweight and portable. Everything should be set up. You can just go ahead and have fun practicing your selections for keyboard skills um, or, you know, working out some of your own compositions. Uh, I think this is a really awesome piece of equipment to have. But what even makes it more awesome is that it uh, works with your MacBook. So that's what I'm going to get into next is how we set up our keyboard to engage with our Logic Pro on our Apple MacBook Pro. Stay tuned. Okay, so if you have a keyboard and a laptop, you can make them talk to each other and take your music production or your music composition to the next level. It can be used to use a music score notation editing software like MuseScore or Finale. It can be used with Piano Marvel um, or any other interactive music applications that you might be using in your classes. Um, but my favorite way to use it is in a recording software to create my own instrumental productions. Um, so it included this uh, cable, which is a micro USB to a regular USB, the blade that we're all used to seeing. So uh, I'm going to take this off the rubber band. I have my laptop here. I actually have Logic Pro open on my laptop with an empty session with uh, probably a software instrument track already loaded here. So this part plugs into the back of your keyboard. There's only one connector port for this cable. So I've plugged it in right here. And the other side, I'm going to put into my USB hub since we don't have traditional or old school uh, USB ports on our laptop, okay? So that's gonna go into here. I've got Logic Pro open. 
and it hasn't asked me if I wanted to use it, but it's already reading it. So what I want to do is completely turn down the volume on my piano here because I only want to output from my speakers because I'm going to be using a bunch of different varieties of sounds using triggered by my Casio tone. So this is now kind of a controller to create MIDI information or um, record using different uh, instrument samples. So my favorite way to use a keyboard is to turn it into more of like a, sometimes like a synthesizer, like um, pads or like ambient sounds. I like this ambient lead sound, let's see. Logic Library, if you haven't explored it, has so many different samples to use. Um, all different kinds of pianos, orchestral sounds. I just think a, an amazing Steinway Grand Piano um, sample is amazing, it's just great. But I could go on and on. Um, you can build your own drum kits using this. You can build your own beats. Um, the creative opportunity is endless, but not a lot of people knew that their keyboard was uh, compatible with their software on their computer. And so I just wanted to show you how to connect them and just take um, your scoring, your composition, your songwriting, your productions to like an even greater level. So I just hope that you follow with this video, start it over, get everything set up and just have fun. That's the most important. You can always email me um, if you have any questions or any issues, all right? Um, I feel like making something, so I'm just gonna go ahead and get into it. Have fun.